Like one of my favorite verses of scripture is 1 Peter 3, 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. That word defense, or you could translate it answer, as it is in some translations, comes from that Greek word, apologia. Always be ready to give an apologetic to everyone who asks you for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, as I've traveled around the world the past 35 years, I've been asked all sorts of questions like, you believe the Bible? Where did God come from? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How can they get the animals on the ark? What about the ape men? What do you do with the millions of years? Uh, and, and so it goes on. In fact, the biggest selling creation apologetics books in the world, uh, we produce these, are the Four Answers books. They have 130 of all the most asked questions uh, that we have received over the past 30 odd years, and we've got detailed answers. And we also have, and we're going to do this as a special at the end for you, we have a series of pocket guides uh, that are various topics like what is science and the six days and Noah's flood and the age of the earth. These are normally $6 each, but at these sessions, uh, we let you have them at a, at a subsidized price of $1 each, including tax. And we do that for all of our school sessions like this because we want to equip you. And we don't give them to you because we find if we just give things away, a lot of times they just get thrown in the trash or whatever. But if you pay for something for them, we trust that you will read them. So that'll be available for you at the end. We also have three DVDs uh, that are uh, th normal. This one's normally $13. This one is uh, $20. It has six animated videos on it. And this one, Evolution versus God, you can have those for $2 each at the end. Uh, so we want to be able to equip you to have these special items that are only available at those uh, prices, subsidized prices at the end of this session. And so what I want to do is to go through and just show you how you answer questions. You know, when I was a school teacher, one of the first science classes that I ever taught, I taught in the public schools in Australia, and I taught science, and one of the first lessons that I ever taught, one of the students put his hand up and said, Sir, I hear you're a Christian. I said, that's true. And he said, how can you be a Christian? Because we know the Bible's not true. I said, how do you know the Bible's not true? And they opened up their textbook and said, because of all this in here about evolution and millions of years, obviously the Bible can't be true. And I started to realize that for many of those young people, the teaching of evolution, millions of years, that now permeates the public school system, permeates the television, permeates the whole world in our secular museums, causes many young people to doubt that you can trust the Bible. You know one of the statistics in America right now? Two-thirds of young people are leaving the church and not returning by the time they reach college age. I would hate to think, looking at a room like this, that two-thirds of you will abandon church and, and, and that'll be it, turn your back uh, on the Lord, turn your back on His Word. And when we've done the research as to why it is, mostly it's to do with the fact of what they've been taught about issues of the age of the earth, evolution in this day and age, that cause young people like yourselves to doubt that you can trust the Bible. So what I wanted to do in this session was to show you how we can answer questions and teach you to defend your faith and show you the Bible is true. This is not just an ordinary book. This is not just a book of stories. This is a book of history. This is God's book. And so we're going to go through a, a number of questions. We won't get through all of these. We'll get through some of them. And you can do a lot more uh, looking at the videos or getting the books or, or going online. Our website, answersingenesis.org. I encourage you to bookmark uh, our website. This website has thousands and thousands of articles, thousands of articles. We also have a technical journal website. Uh, we have a number of websites associated with that. And a lot of the questions you have, if you just type in your question, you'll often find invariably, well, I'd say most of the questions you're going to ask, you'll find there are answers there. You'll find there are articles, and it'll come up with all the articles. We, have, we use a Google-based search engine, actually, on our website. So I encourage you to go and use that and get some of those answers. And so the first question we want to look at, is there any evidence for an infinite God? What happens when somebody comes to you and says, how do you know there's a God anyway? And I mean, you know, if, if there is a God, then who made God? And how can you understand that? And a lot of us struggle with that. And the reason we struggle with it is because we're finite beings. And for us who are finite beings, who know nothing compared to an infinite being, an infinite creator God. How do we understand that? You know, it says in the Bible in Romans 1.20, the, uh, the, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. You know, the Bible says, it is so obvious there's a God. If you do not believe in God, you're without excuse. In fact, that's why the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, because it's so obvious that there's a God. This first session, you know, I'm 
sorry to tell you this, but this is sort of like being in school, and we're gonna have a little class in biochemistry, and a little class in, in biology, and then a little class in geology. Isn't that fun? Don't, didn't you wanna come here and do that? Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. The first session is, this first section is probably the hardest to grasp hold of, but I think you can all, all do that. We're gonna look at what I think is one of the most obvious evidences that God created. We're gonna look at DNA. You've heard of DNA, haven't you? that molecule of heredity that makes up our genes, makes up our chromosomes, has all the information that builds a human or a dog or a cat. In fact, you're made of trillions of cells. And in nearly every one of your cells, you have all the information that builds you. And when you type that out, uh, as, as they look at the DNA, they estimate you could fill a thousand books, 500 pages each, with just with all the instructions that the DNA in one set of your genes has. They now think that's way underestimated. In other words, they think there's massive amount of information. And think about that, you, you, in those cells and going down DNA that you can't even see with a microscope and yet you've got all that information. It's incredible, absolutely mind blowing. You know the first two people to discover the helical structure of DNA were two English scientists, Watson and Crick. They were atheists. And in fact, uh, they only died in the last few years there were atheists who said, we want to show there's no God. We're going to show you that life is built on chemistry alone, that there's no God. And this was the very first model they came up with of the DNA molecule. And in fact, I've hand set a bit for you. It's in a museum over in London in England. And they said, see, life is just chemistry. Well, you know what's interesting? We have found out since then, done a lot of research and realized DNA is not just chemistry. You know what DNA is? You know what we found out it is? It's like a whole library of information and all these instructions, but you've got to have a language to read it. See, this, is, this Bible is in English, and I can read it because there are words on the page, words in sentences, and uh, the ink is used to make those words, and I can read it, and I can get information. But you see, if I didn't have the language, I couldn't read it. If this was in Russian, I wouldn't know what it, what it was saying at all. And so what we found out is that DNA is like books of information that's read by a language. You know what else we found out? That DNA has the information to make the language that reads the DNA, that makes the information to make the language that reads the DNA. You get the idea? It's all gotta be there or it won't work. Let me explain what DNA is. Here we have a piece of rope, and that rope has beads on it. See those red and green beads? Those red and green beads actually spell out the word help. You all agree with that, right? You're not sure? If you know the Morse code, they spell out the word help. If you don't know the Morse code, they're red and green beads on a rope. Okay, so if you know the language, if you know the code, you can read the message. Do you realize you could write the entire Bible on a piece of rope with beads like that? <laughs> Be a long rope, by the way. <laughs> but you could actually do it. The, the, the point I wanna to make to you is DNA is sort of like that. I like to use analogies, and, uh, and as a teacher, I want students to understand things. Sometimes you can say things in such a technical way you won't get it. It's better to stand back and get the big picture, and that's what I try to do. So DNA is like two pieces of rope, the helical structure of DNA, has molecules, base pairs lined up. They're like those beads on a rope, and they have all these instructions on how to build you. And, and as I said, in just one set, of, one set of your genes, it's estimated at least a thousand books, 500 pages, close type, written. But you see, you've got to have a code to read that. Now, when I went to university, I remember one of my professors who said, look, I can prove to you there is no God. He said, DNA came about by chance random processes. It's just chemistry. You don't need God. And so he cut up the letters of the alphabet and put them in a hat to prove this. By the way, I should have asked him where the letters of the alphabet come from, but we didn't do that. So we'll just go on. They just happen. They're there. All right, so we got the letters of the alphabet. He cut them up, put them in a hat. Then he handed the hat around the class and asked students to pull out letters. Three students pulled out B, followed by A, followed by T. And he stopped and says, wait a minute, we got a word. That was by chance. Those three students just happened to pull a B and an A and a T. You know, like somebody winning the lottery. Oh, they got the right numbers. And he said, see, you could get more students who get words. You could even get students who get sentences. You could get the whole Encyclopedia Britannica. Now it sounds remote, but there's always the possibility you could just happen to pull them out in the right order. And see, that's what happened millions of years ago. It just so happened all these molecules lined up in just the right order, just like winning the lottery. There we are. We get life. Let's go on. There is no God. Man, I'd love to go back and talk to my professor now and go back and say, excuse me, was that word, B-A-T, a word to a Frenchman, a Dutchman, a Chinese? Who's it a word to? It's only a word to somebody who already has what? 
the language, or the code. Without the code, that word is meaningless. Remember, without the Morse code, you wouldn't understand that, that those beads actually spelled out the word help. And here's what's interesting. You see, DNA is like books of information read by a code. Well, a scientist in Germany, Dr. Werner Gitt, is an information scientist. And he has studied information, and studied information and DNA. And here's what he says. There is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information. Stop right there for a moment. If life is going to evolve, there's no God, matter has to produce all this information. He says, there's no law for that. Nobody's ever seen matter produce one bit of information. And then he goes on and says, a code system, a language system, is always the result of a mental process. Stop right there for a moment. If life evolved, matter has to produce a code, and matter has to produce information. Nobody's ever seen matter produce an information. And we know that codes never come about by chance processes, always come from an intelligence. Do you know, do you know what DNA is really saying? In the beginning, God. Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Wow, you are so excited. If you were any more excited, the world would collapse right now and be destroyed. Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Yes, of course it's exciting to be a Christian. Now, I, I want you to understand this, okay? I want you to understand something. Do you know how much information is out there in living things? This is where it gets so mind-boggling. I, I, I talked about this last night, and uh, if any of you were here last night, and I, I presume there were some of you here last night, I'm going to do some of those same things on biology again today for the sake of all the rest of you. Um, that won't hurt for you to have a little revision anyway. But the number of atoms in the universe, if you've ever tried to count them, you know how big an atom is, the number of atoms is 10 to the 80th power. That's a 1 followed by 80 zeros. Do you know how much information is in your genes right now? If you took one man and one woman from this audience, do you know how many children you can potentially have from the information in your genes without having two with the same combination of information? Well, it's that number. God inbuilt that sort of variability in the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. That's why this, you can get such incredible variability in living things. Now, for those who believe in evolution, they believe that matter produced an information system, matter produced a code system, and over millions of years, you've got to get new information produced. For instance, reptiles do not have in their genes the instructions for how to build a feather. So if you're going to change a reptile into a bird, somehow matter has to produce all the instructions for building a feather and get it into the genes. And you see, as I said to you, when you look at DNA, DNA is an information system and a language system, but information only comes from information. Languages only come from an intelligence. That's impossible. It, th there's zillions of bits of information out there in living things. Zillions of bits. I mean, you look at all the animals and plants, the incredible variability that's in their genes. It's zillions of bits of information read by a code system. How do, how do the atheists explain that? You know, many years ago, Long time ago, you heard of Richard Dawkins, that famous atheist from, from England? Richard Dawkins, years ago, we had somebody, this, is, this video is a bit scratchy and, and the volume is not real good, so we're going to work with it a bit for you. But uh, years ago, he was asked a question, Dr. Dawkins, Dr. Dawkins, can you give one example, just one, where we see matter producing information? Keep in mind, according to evolutionists, matter had to produce information zillions of times. So it should be a law of nature, it should be obvious. So give one example. Listen to what he said. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Listen carefully, don't miss his answer. He gave the right answer. That's my favorite part of the video, by the way. You know what, we've got to see it again. You've got to see us again, because I want you to hear Richard Dawkins, because you might have missed it the first time, so I don't want you to miss it, I want you to hear it. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Now, he couldn't give one answer. It should be obvious. There's millions, zillions of bits of information. Now, you might say, okay, that was 20-odd years ago. What would he say now? I'm glad you asked me that question. How many of you saw the movie Expelled? Only a few of you. Um, it's a very interesting movie, narrated by Ben Stein. 
But Richard Dawkins was interviewed in this, and Richard Dawkins was asked a similar question, and this movie came out just a few years ago. He was asked a question uh, about, uh, do you think, you know, intelligent design, do you think there's a designer behind life? It's sort of the same sort of question. How do you account for life? How do you account for information? Listen to what he said. What do you think is the possibility that there's an intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Oh, that's the answer. Aliens. How do you explain the, you know, the, what, you know, ev evidence of intelligent design. Aliens, there were aliens that brought life to Earth. Oh, okay. Where did those aliens come from? I guess there had to be another planet with aliens that brought life to that planet so they could bring life to this planet. Where did those aliens come from? Well, there's gonna have to be another lot of aliens somewhere who brought life to that planet, who brought life to the other planet, who then were able to bring life to Earth. Well, where did those aliens come from? Well, I guess they would... You know what, he'd be happy to believe in eternal aliens but he won't believe in an eternal God. Doesn't that tell you something about these people? See, see, and where did matter come from? Uh, how many of you saw the Bill Nye debate, just for interest? Uh, do you remember, and a lot of you did, that's great. Do you remember when Bill Nye was asked the question, where did matter come from? And his answer was, we don't know, it's a great mystery. And then the moderator said, Mr. Ham, what's your answer? And I said, well, Bill, there is a book. There is a book that tells you where matter came from. In the beginning, God. See, wh wh what's Bill Nye going to believe in? Eternal matter? He mocks it an eternal God, but he's going to believe in eternal matter. Well, then where did matter come from? How, how did it even come into existence? You know, if you think about it, another thing that I said to Bill Nye was, how do you account for the laws of nature? Because we believe in the laws of nature. They're the same today and they'll be the same tomorrow. The laws that govern the universe, the laws by which things operate. If it's just a, a random universe, how did they come about? Did they come about by random processes? How do you know they're going to stay the same? Why would they even exist? How do you account for the laws of nature without a biblical God? He couldn't answer the question. It's a great mystery. He, he doesn't know. But how did they come into existence? Where did they come from? People, the only thing that makes logical sense is in the beginning God. Nothing else makes sense. Why, why do we even believe in the uniformity of nature? Why are the laws of logic? You know, I, uh, I've had many young people uh, ask me questions uh, over time. I, rem I remember after one talk I gave, I had a young man come down and said, Ah, oh, Mr. Ham, I still believe we evolve by chance random processes. And I said, You do? Yes, sir. I said, So if we evolve by chance random processes, your brain evolved by chance random processes, right? Well, yes, sir. I said, if your brain evolved by chance random processes, you don't even know it evolved the right way. Son, you don't even know if you're asking me the right question. <laughs> to which he answered, what was the name of those books you recommended? <laughs> because he, he started to realize what it was all about. But let's go on with what Richard Dawkins is saying here. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail details of biochemistry and molecular biology, you might find a signature. By the way, when he says the details of biochemistry, you might find a signature. Do you know what he's saying? When you look at biochemistry, like studying DNA, you see DNA, you see evidence of intelligence, which you do because there's a code system and an information system. Of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. And that's very obvious that uh, he just doesn't want to believe in God. And it's interesting, so what's he going to believe in? Eternal aliens? Eternal matter? How about an eternal God? No, no, not an eternal God. Because to believe in the God of the Bible means that we're a sinner, means God created us, means we're to be in submission to Him, we, it means we're to acknowledge who, who we are, what our problem is, and what our solution is in Jesus Christ. I want to say this to you. 
Richard Dawkins has a blind faith. You know, I've had many young people in churches when I've said to them, do you believe in God? Yes, how do you know? Well, by faith. I said, what sort of faith? They say, I guess it's a blind faith. No, it's not. No, it's the atheist that has a blind faith. His faith doesn't make sense of what we see. It doesn't make sense of DNA. It doesn't make sense of a language system, an information system. It doesn't make sense of the laws of nature. Whereas in the beginning, God does make sense of DNA, does make sense of the laws of nature. Christians have an objective faith. It's a faith that makes sense of what we see and a faith you can defend and that science actually confirms. It's the atheists that have a blind faith. So it is exciting being a Christian, isn't it? It is. Well, we've got three people excited now, so that's good. We're getting better. Now, they said, well, what happens when people ask you a question like, who made God? I remember I was at one conference and a young boy came up on stage. He was about eight years old and looks at me and he says, Mr. Ham, who made God? Don't you love that from children? I mean, how do you answer a question like that? So I looked at him and said, well, son, if somebody made God, you'd have to have a bigger God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, I said, now you've got a problem. Yes, sir. Well, who made the bigger God? You'd have to have a bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God, right? Well, yes, sir. Well, now you've got a problem. Yes, sir. Who made the bigger, bigger God? You have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, now you've got a problem. I know. <laughs> Who made the bigger, bigger, bigger God? You have to have a bigger, 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 bigger God who made the bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God. Yes, sir. Well, now you've got, I know. I said, see, you keep going back and you get a bigger and bigger and big. You know the only thing that makes sense? The biggest God of all, the God of the Bible, who exists in eternity outside of time, not limited by natural processes in time, the infinite creator God, the Alpha and Omega, just like the Bible says, that's the only thing that makes logical sense, that could explain the laws of nature, that explain where things came from. And you know what, young people? You can never understand that. None of us can. You know why? We are finite beings. We're created in time. We had a beginning. So you can never understand an infinite creator God. But you see, that's why God reveals to us in his word who we are, where we came from, that he's the eternally existent one, which makes sense of what we see out there. The atheist can't make sense of it at all. Doesn't fit. Doesn't make sense. Because the, the only thing that makes sense is you have an infinite creator God. Well... You know, the secularists are going to try and convince you there is no God in all sorts of ways. Uh, for instance, they, they're trying to do all sorts of experiments in the lab, mixing things together, trying to make life and so on. But even there, I want you to think about this. You imagine, here's a professor, and here he is, 50 years, dedicated research, millions of dollars worth of equipment, all these designed experiments, and he says, if I can just synthesize life here, I'll have proven no intelligence was necessary to form life in the beginning. So here he is trying to use all his intelligence and intelligently designed experiments to try to make life to prove to you what happens by chance processes. It doesn't make sense, does it? And, and mostly what they're doing, when you hear a lot of these claims uh, on the news or read about them, mostly what they're doing is taking God's DNA and cutting it up and copying it and mixing things together. You know what I say? Go get your own DNA. Go make your own. But see, they can't do that. They have to copy what God's already done. It really is exciting being a Christian. Hey, Romans 1.20 is correct. If you don't believe in God, you're without excuse. And so that just gives you just a little bit of understanding. How would you answer that sort of question? Uh, another question people often ask me, they, they would say, well, how could Noah fit all the species of animals on the ark? I'm sure you've heard that question before. Actually, it's the wrong question because the Bible doesn't say species of animals went on Noah's ark. The Bible says two of each kind of land animal. The correct way to ask the question is, how could Noah fit all the kinds of land animals on the ark? For instance, Genesis 6, 19, it says, of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind onto the ark. And then it goes on and qualifies the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals to go on board Noah's ark. The first thing we have to do is understand the word kind. In Genesis 1, the Hebrew word min for kind, what does it really mean? You see, the classification system that we have is an arbitrary system. In Genesis, you read the phrase, God made the animals, plants after their kind, after his kind, ten times. When it comes to man's arbitrary classification system, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, see, many people incorrectly think when the Bible says two of each kind went on Noah's ark, it was two of each species. But in actual fact, we would say 
that the kind in Genesis 1 is much more likely to be, in most instances, the family level of classification. Not the genus, not the species, but the family level. Um, we have scientists right now who are working with, for instance, or different families of land animals ready for our exhibits to go on Noah's Ark. For instance, dogs. Take the dog family, okay? Uh, we're saying that the family is more uh, the level of the kind. So there's one dog family, d different dog genera and different dog species. And what they do is they look all over the world and look for documentation where this species bred with this species and this one with this one and this one with this one. And even though this one mightn't breed with this one, you can still connect them all the way back and they say that's all one kind. And so we'd say that all dogs, dingoes, wolves, coyotes, jackal, fennet, foxes, you know, domestic varieties, they're all one kind. They're all dogs. That's the one family. So only needed two of those on the ark. Not all the different species, just two of the dogs to go on Noah's ark. Also, when it comes to cats, and go back to that, when it comes to cats, there's only one cat kind, one cat family. Different cat genera, different cat species, but they're all cats. We live near the Cincinnati Zoo, and they have an incredible display of cats. And you can go and look at all those cats. There's big cats, there's little cats, there's skinny cats, there's fat cats, there's, there's all sorts of cats. Interesting, as you walk around and look at them, you know, you say, wow, that looks like a cat. Wow, that looks like a cat. Wow, that looks like a cat. They all look like cats. <laughs> but, you know, there's all these different species. You've got tigers and lions and you've got your bobcats and you've got all sorts of different cats. But they're all the one kind. And there's documentation on how you can show how they can interconnect in regard to breeding. And so there's only two cats were needed on Noah's Ark. And so it goes on. And so when it comes to dogs, and I like to explain this to you because this is very important. So you've got all these different species of dogs, including your domestic species. When people see all those changes like that, they think that that's evolution. But it's got nothing to do with evolution. In fact, it really involves a loss of information a loss of information. Let me explain it to you. We don't know how many dogs God made originally, but let's say he made two dogs, and, and then as a result of those two dogs, eventually uh, you end up with lots of dogs, okay? Now, in genetics, we have a convention. I'm sure you've already learned this at school. We have a convention in genetics where you label genes with letters. Capital letters, dominant genes. Little letters, recessive genes. Remember doing that? Now, it's much more complicated than this, but it gives you the idea. So here's a male and female dog here. Now, there's millions of genes, but this gives you the idea. And so they have an offspring. Sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the male, one from the female. There we have an offspring. Big A's, big B's, big C's. Notice, this offspring here hasn't got any little A's, little B's, or little C's. It's really lost variability, actually lost information compared to the male and female here. And so you can get all these other combinations. I like to use the little a's, little b's, little c's to help illustrate. I say that represents what we call purebred dogs. You know, you know the purebred dogs like chihuahuas and poodles and the English bulldog and uh, bichons. And uh, what do I mean by purebred? Well, we breed them through artificial selection and we'll say, here's a dog that's got big ears and another dog with big ears. Let's breed them together so none of the genes for little ears exist in the dog anymore. And so we're actually selecting information and getting rid of information. You get the idea? And, and so when we look at our purebred dog, for instance, uh, I like to say that the little A's, little B's, little C's represent something like a poodle or chihuahua or something like that. If this is a poodle and you breed a poodle with a poodle, you're only going to end up with a poodle, right? You can't get back the original dog. But if you start with the original dog, could you theoretically get a poodle again? And the answer is what? Yes. Because a poodle doesn't have all the information that was in the genes where the original dog does. You get the idea? See, what I'm saying is when God created the dog kind, the elephant kind, the cat kind, he put all this information already there. And so over time, you can get all sorts of different combinations. Remember I said to you, number of atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th power, but from one man and one woman, you can get 10 to the 2017th combinations for children. So an incredible amount of variability that's already there. Now, so for dogs, you only need two on Noah's Ark. They come off the Ark, then increase in numbers after the Ark, and as they increase in numbers, what's going to happen? They're going to move away from each other, and as they do, you'll end up with different combinations of genes in different places. They, they, they call this, in the public school textbooks, natural selection, adaptation. Let me explain to you what's really going on here. Because natural selection, adaptation, those terms are used as supposed 
mechanisms for evolution in the public school textbooks. Actually, I want to show you when you correctly understand natural selection and adaptation, it actually is evidence against evolution, against evolution. Let me show you. If these two dogs got off Noah's Ark, S gene for short hair, L gene for long hair, S and L together give you a medium hair length dog. They can have an offspring that's got two S genes. Look at that for a moment. It's got short hair. Do you know how they convince students in the public schools and also uh, you will see on television documentaries that evolution's happening? Look, that dog has something new. It's got short hair. Something new, they try to make out it's evolving. Just like with Darwin's finches, they say, oh, look, they're finches with small beaks, medium-sized beaks, large beaks, obviously different species of finches, that's evolution. It has nothing to do with evolution. If you look at this dog here, it has a different combination of genes to the parents, but all that information already existed. In fact, it's got less information than the parents. It no longer has the L gene. Now, you can also get one with an S and L. Then you can get one that has two Ls. Look, long hair. Oh, look, it's got something new. Is it evolving? Actually, it's got a different combination of genes in the parents. It has two Ls, but it's actually got less the genes in the parents because it doesn't have the S gene. And so what they call natural selection or adaptation, here's what happens. As those dogs move out, you can imagine, after Noah's Ark, Noah's Flood, you get the kinds coming off the Ark. As they're moving away from each other, you're going to form different species. So speciation has occurred a lot in the past. Because as they move out to different areas, what happens? Well, this sort of thing. Imagine dogs move towards a cold climate. In a cold climate, those with short hair, medium hair get colds. And then they die. <laughs> and now you're only left with dogs with L genes who are on their own, only produce dogs with what? L genes. So you're forming a different species of dogs, going to look different, but it's lost information. Notice that? Uh, what about those that go towards a hot climate? In a hot climate, what happens? Well, those with medium hair and long hair overheat, and they die. <laughs> and now you're left with dogs with S genes who are on their own, only produce dogs with what? S genes. And so what happens is this. You see, what's new? There's a new combination of already existing information. You have less variability than the parents, which is the opposite of evolution. Natural selection involves new combinations, it involves loss of information, conserving information, opposite of evolution that requires all this new information. If you're going to turn reptiles into birds, reptiles do not have the instructions for feathers, as I said earlier. So somehow matter has to produce that. There's zillions of bits of information. We see loss of information, new combinations of information. We don't see new information forming. People, evolution is impossible. It's an impossible process. It cannot happen, does not happen. I can't believe that so many people are so brainwashed by these evolutionists that evolution is occurring. Think about it. Stand back. Where do you see it happening anywhere in the world today? You know what they'll point to? Bill Nye just came out with a new book called Undeniable. You know one of the evidences for evolution in there? The finches. Darwin's finches. What were they? Finches. What are they? Finches. What will they be? Finches. Is that evolution? It's finches. So are they? There are finches with little beaks, big beaks, medium-sized beaks. Is that evolution? Look around here. You've got people with big beaks, little beaks, medium-sized beaks. That's not evolution, is it? And so you see, over time, what happens? You produce all these different species of dogs, which we see today. Helps us understand Noah didn't need anywhere near the number of animals that he needed on Noah's Ark that we think. In fact, our scientists are predicting right now, based on real research, looking at animals all over the world and which ones are bred with which and, and distinguishing the separate kinds, they're predicting right now, it looks like, ready for our opening of the ARC project in 2016, we'll be able to tell people there's less than actually 1,000 land animal kinds. So just over 2,000 animals, two of each kind, seven of some, but two of, two of uh, all the animals, land animals, and most, the average size of a land animal is pretty small. People, you know what that means? There's tons of room on the ark. So you see, when anyone says to you, Noah couldn't fit the animals on the ark, you need to say, well, how many animals did he need? What does the Bible say he took? What does the word kind mean? Have you looked into research to show the limits of a kind? We have. Here's what we found. Here's an answer for you. You know, it makes a big difference when you give those answers. Now, I want to show you a short video. This is uh, the DVD that we said you can have for $2 later. It's got six animated videos, and I'm going to show you one of them. And the these are really great. They're very fast-paced, so they do in about 
two to three minutes what normally takes us an hour to, to present to you. So I'm going to show you this. There's, there's one uh, dealing with evolution. There's one on dating methods, not the dating methods you might want to talk about, but uh, uh, age dating methods for the Earth, radiometric dating methods. There's one on uh, skin color and race issue, that there's only one skin color in humans. There's only one race and, and that sort of thing. But anyway, let me show you this one. You hear this one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really, let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, Follow along if you would. Fact one. There is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't. Plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they've imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules demand evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. There you are, see? Enough said. <laughs> exactly. Now, I want to show you something that's fascinating. How many of you have heard of Ray Comfort, by the way? Uh, just a few of you. Ray Comfort he is actually from New Zealand originally. He has a ministry in California. And uh, Ray is great at going out and interviewing people in the street. And he put together this DVD called Evolution Versus God. This is one of the other ones we make available to you at a very inexpensive uh, price. And in this one, he's interviewing, he interviewed students and professors at three uh, universities in California, secular universities, and asked them, can you give an example of evolution, of, of uh, 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 evolution occurring in animals and plants and so on? And one of the things you'll find is the main example that they give uh, are Darwin's finches. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Darwin's finches. Darwin collected these birds from the Galapagos, and as they were looked at later on, they said, well, look at these finches. There's different species of finches, and they have different beak sizes. Oh, this is, this is all a part of evolution. In fact, Darwin, in his notes, drew this tree. He actually said, I think, and he's saying that they're all related. By the way, we would say that all these finches are related and do belong you know, to one tree, but then Darwin goes on to say they're all a part of the one big tree of evolution. That all those little changes in the, in the finch species you see, it's all a part of an evolutionary process. Well, I want you to see what happens when these professors and students uh, are asked about their evidence for evolution, and I want you to hear what Ray Comfort says to them. When you say change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another. Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. 
Could you give me one instance? Yeah. We have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observed. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What do the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course they're still finches, yes. Yeah. So they're not a change of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he, uh, that he had observed that... Oh, what did they become? Um... Their beaks, their beak shapes. They're, they're still common. birds. Yes. Three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're on still species. finches. Well, for example, Darwin and, and his study on evolution of the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed? Their beaks. Uh, they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within the kind. It's evolution on the beaks. That's so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief and the change of kinds is scientific. Darwin spoke of a change of kind. You know, it's interesting. When you come to the Creation Museum, we have a display of Darwin's finches. These look exactly like the finches uh, that Darwin actually collected. And right beside them, we have dog skulls because we want to show people there's more variation in those dog skulls than there are in those finches. Yet they wouldn't use dogs as an example of evolution, but because Darwin discovered these finches in the Galapagos, they used that as supposed evidence for, for evolution. And like we did with the genes and the dogs, I was showing you really this difference in size here for the finches and difference in beaks uh, as a result of what they call natural selection adaptation is only to do with, with different combinations of information. That's nothing to do with evolution. Zero to do with evolution. And notice even that professor who said, well, of course they're still finches. And all the students, but they're still, when they're told, but they're still finches. They're still finches. That's the whole point. You see, when, when during the Bill Nye debate, I said on the basis of the Bible, God created, if you like, an orchard. We call it the creation orchard different kinds of animals and plants so that you can have great variation, different species within a kind, and that's exactly what the science of genetic confirms. But Bill and I believe that they're all related and all little changes you see add up to one tree. That one tree is not true. It doesn't work. In fact, all those branches here, that's all fiction. They don't see those. You know, you look around the world today. Where do you see one kind of animal changing into a totally different kind? Where do you see something that's transitional forms? I mean, you will see different species and different species within a kind. We can even see some new species forming. It's, it's rarer today, but we see some of that because a lot of it's already happened. But you don't see evolution, not in the molecules to man sense. You don't observe it anyway. We can classify animals and plants in groups, kind. It's just amazing that people are so brainwashed to believe this fictional story of evolution. Well, so I'm saying we can, we can answer the question, how could Noah get the animals on the ark? He didn't need near the number of animals we think. Of course, then people ask the question about Noah's flood. Well, is there any evidence for a flood? People say, I don't see any evidence for a flood. Actually, if there was a global flood, you'd expect to see billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And I've had many people over the years say, where's the evidence for a flood? I mean, there's no evidence. All you find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Where's the evidence for a flood? Well, it's staring, staring at us, staring us in the face. You know, it's interesting. I've been to the Grand Canyon with an evolutionist who said to me, we stood on the Grand Canyon. The evolutionist said, a long time and a little bit of water did this. I said, oh, really? I stood there and said, a long, a lot of water and a little bit of time did this. So very, very different. Look, I couldn't bring our geologist with us. We have a PhD in geology, Dr. Andrew Snelling, at our ministry. And so I have a video of him. I want him to give you some of the best flood evidences. You know those layers at the Grand Canyon that I just showed you, uh, these layers here? You know many people don't realize this? Most students in schools aren't taught this because really the secularists don't want you to know. Do you know how far those layers extend? We think they're just there in, in Arizona, that sort of area. Do you know how far some of those layers extend? Some of those layers extend in other places in the continental US and in other continents around the world. They're massive. They're ma People don't realize that. People haven't been taught this information. And they, then they, because if they were, they'd start to realize, wait a minute, this business of millions of years doesn't make sense. Let's hear what Dr. Andrew Snelling has to say. What are some of the best flood evidences? If the flood really did occur, what evidence would we look for? You know, most people haven't even thought of that question, let alone thought of an answer. You know, the Bible says that 
the fountains of the great deep were open, the rain fell from heaven for 40 days and 40 nights, the waters rose 150 days until all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered and the mountains were covered. And we're told that all land dwelling, air breathing life perished except for those on the ark. Wouldn't we expect to find billions of dead plants and animals buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. But let's expand on that. Let's look at six of the best evidences for the flood. Evidence number one, sea creatures buried high in mountains on the continents. That's right, marine creatures that live in the ocean are found in mountains like the Himalayas. How did they get there? Unless the ocean waters rose up over the continents. And we find marine creatures in rock layers all over the continents everywhere around the world. Evidence number two, we'd find rapidly buried plants and animals. Well, we do, fossils. We find fossils not only of plants, but of bees, of bats. We find fish that are, uh, haven't finished having their breakfast eating another fish they're buried and fossilised. Ichthyosaurs giving birth to babies and they're fossilised. We find delicately preserved fossilised jellyfish. How do you fossilise a jellyfish slowly? Evidence number three, rapidly deposited sediment layers right across the continents. We find that everywhere we look. Look at the red wall limestone, full of fossils in the Grand Canyon. Yet the same limestone layer is found in the same position over in Pennsylvania, then over in England, and even in the Himalayas. The chalk beds, the White Cliffs of Dover, we find the same chalk beds in Europe, in the Middle East, over into Kazakhstan, we find the same chalk beds with the same fossils in Texas and the Midwestern United States. We find the same chalk beds in Western Australia. The coal beds of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are also found in, in England and Europe, right across to the Ural Mountains. Evidence number four, long transport distance of sediments. The Coconino sandstone in the Grand Canyon. The sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed from it far north as at least Wyoming. The Navajo sandstone in Zion National Park, those huge white cliffs, the sand grains are believed to have been eroded and washed all the way from the Appalachians right across North America. Evidence number five, rapid or no erosion between uh, sediment layers. Again, think in terms of the uh, Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale, it's a, there's a knife edge, flat featureless boundary between those two rock layers for mile after mile through the Grand Canyon. Yet the geologists claim that there's 10 million years missing at that boundary. What would have happened during 10 million years of weathering and erosion? You'd get a topography, not a flat featureless boundary. The bottom of the Grand Canyon, the Tapit sandstone sits on the pre-flood rocks and we have evidence of huge erosion there with boulders being picked up from the underlying rock layers indicating rapid erosion. Evidence number six, we find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. Look at the walls of the Grand Canyon, from the Tapeats at the bottom to the Kaibab limestone at the top, supposed to be representing 300 million years of slow and gradual sedimentary deposition. When the plateau was pushed up, those rock layers were bent and folded, but they were folded without fracturing. They had to be soft if they were bent without fracturing. That means, that they could only have just have been deposited. But that means the 300 million years never happened. All those rock layers had to be rapidly deposited in quick succession during the flood year. So you see, when you ask the right question, you get the right answers. Who are we going to believe? The scientists who weren't there, who don't know everything and sometimes make mistakes, or the word of God who was there, who saw what happened and told us what happened during the flood. And what we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's Word. You know, many people have been taught over the years that layers form slowly over millions of years, canyons form slowly. In fact, one of the things that uh, we've been taught is that when you go to a canyon and you look down, like the Grand Canyon, you look down to the Colorado River, you assume the river eroded the canyon. But how do you know the river eroded the canyon when you weren't there to see it? How do you know the canyon wasn't eroded to allow the river to flow through? For instance, when Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18th, uh, 1980, hundreds of feet of sedimentary layers were laid down as a result of the catastrophic action. That layer in the middle that's 30 feet thick consists of thousands of individual layers like that, but that was all laid down in three hours. 
there's a canyon formed by a mud flow to allow the Toodle River to go through. If you go there today, you would assume the river eroded the canyon, but the canyon was eroded by a mud flow. In fact, there were canyons eroded over a matter of just a few years, few months to a few years, even mud flows carving through hard rock, hard basalt rock, uh, forming these canyons that normally would have been interpreted as taking millions of years to form. Now, when you go to the Grand Canyon, you have to go up. The canyon actually cuts through a plateau. That whole area is raised up. And as Dr. Andrew Snelling was just telling you, you can actually go and see where the rocks were raised up. You can go to the Depeat sandstones here. And as you look at these sandstones here, you can see where it was bent. Now, here's the thing. It's not broken. It's not fractured. See, the evolutionists would tell us these layers were laid down slowly over millions of years, hardened into rock, then there were millions of years of layers on top of that, then heat and pressure raised this area up. Uh, if, if that's the so, heat and pressure over millions of years would have turned sedimentary rock into more metamorphic rock. There's no evidence of any metamorphic processes, and this would have been broken, but it's not. It was lifted up while it was wet. See, people have the idea that you know, there's no way there could be a global flood. There's not enough water to cover the Earth. If you actually smooth out the Earth's surface, there's enough water. If you smooth out the land, the ocean basin, so it's just a round, smooth Earth, there's enough water right now on the Earth's surface to cover to a depth of two miles. There's plenty of water. You see, the way God ended the flood, Psalm 104 seems to indicate the way God ended the flood, raised up the mountains, lowered the ocean basins. Now think about this, on the top of the Himalayas, there are marine fossils, as Andrew said. How do they get there? Mount Everest, there are, there are marine fossils at the top of Mount Everest. How'd they get there? The flood didn't cover Mount Everest or the Himalayas uh, in general. What happened? At the end of the flood, God raised up the mountains. Those layers were laid down, raised them up, sank the ocean basins, and the water poured off into the earth, creating all sorts of erosional features all across the earth. The mountains obviously weren't as high, or the oceans weren't as deep before the flood. When people say, oh, there's not enough water to cover the Earth, that's assuming the Earth's topography is just like it is now. But even evolutionists will say that those mountains were raised up. Now, they believe it happened over millions of years. We're saying, no, it happened quite quickly, quite catastrophically. And in fact, you can see it right here at the Grand Canyon, where those layers were bent. They're not broken. Now, behind the Grand Canyon, if you go behind the Grand Canyon, you'll see evidence there of dry lake beds. There were massive lakes once there don't have water in them now, but they did after the flood. Leftover waters from the flood, rains after the flood. And because this area was very soft and had been raised up, uh, it fractured uh, and, and, and the, the dam broke and the water carved out the canyon. In other words, we're saying the canyon was carved to allow the Colorado River to come through. Well, if that's the case, people say, where do all the sediment go? Actually, when you go downstream from the Grand Canyon, there is these massive surge deposits where the sediment was deposited. The evidence is all there. It's all consistent with a catastrophic origin, totally different to what most people are told about millions of years. It's all consistent with what the Bible's telling us about the flood of Noah's day. You know, then I have people say to me, but doesn't it take millions of years to make a fossil? I mean, how long ago was the flood? According to the Bible, about 4,300 years ago. So you're saying most fossils are only 4,300 years old? That's correct, or younger. But it takes millions of years to make a fossil. Well, no. Here's one of my favorite fossils. It's no relation of mine. Uh, but somebody left a ham on a table in a village in New Zealand, was covered by volcanic ash and dust. When they dug it out later, they found it petrified. It didn't take millions of years. This fish here, Andrew showed you this in the, in the video. It, this is one from our Creation Museum. We have a beautiful fossil collection there, you can see. But this fish uh, was eating its breakfast, if you like. And what happened? Well, it was fossilized. So whatever happened, happened very quickly. In fact, the more you look at the fossil record, the more you see it can't be millions of years old. Whatever happened, happened quickly. You know, in recent times, scientists have also been absolutely astounded to find when you take dinosaur bones, said to be, you know, 70 odd million years old, and you dissolve out the mineralization in them, increasingly uh, we are finding uh, that there's soft tissue, uh, blood cells. How could that be? In fact, this was a, a little segment of a documentary that was shown on the Discovery Channel. This is the scientist who first discovered this, Mary Schweitzer. I'm not going to believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, 
they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments. That's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Did you notice she didn't say we got to rethink the time? Now here's an interesting thing. If you believe in thousands of years for the age of the universe, as I certainly do, and our scientists do, based upon the Bible, God made everything in six days, and then you have all those genealogies, and you add up all the dates, it comes to about 6,000 years. If you believe in that, the evolutionists will mock at you, they'll get emotional, they'll have an emotional meltdown, uh, they scoff at you. You know, when the secular media come to the Creation Museum and interview me, it, it's usually not, why do I not believe in evolution? It's, it's usually, how come you people believe in a young earth? That's so stupid, that's so ridiculous. But do you know why they get so emotional? Do you know why th they, they really scoff at you if you believe in a young earth and young universe? I want to warn you about that. If you do, they will just, they will scoff at you. They'll call you anti-academic, anti-science, uh, anti-intellectual. You know why? People, how do you convince someone that an incomprehensible process is occurring? That the little changes we see that we can explain from genetics, changes in finches or whatever, how do you convince someone that that's a mechanism for evolution, that first of all, life evolved from non-life and over, over millions of years, one kind of animal changes into a totally different kind? That's an incomprehensible process. How do you convince someone of that? You indoctrinate them to believe there's an incomprehensible amount of time. You see, they have to have millions of years. Because given all that time, to them anything can happen. Oh yeah, but we got millions of years. We don't see it happening today. Oh yeah, but it took millions of years. Well, how do you know it happened? Well, given, given enough time, see, time is their God. Millions of years is really their religion. It's really a pagan religion. And that's why they will not question the time. Even though everything we observe just speaks against the billions of years. Now, just to show you, uh, why I believe what I do, six literal days or long periods of time. Well, when you start with what the Bible says, it says that God made everything in six days. In fact, an estimate for the age of the earth based upon the Bible, you have five days before Adam, from Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years, Abraham until today, 4,000 years. That's where the 6,000 years actually comes from. In fact, the Bible gives us very specific dates and ages tells us Adam was made on day six, and that Adam at 130 years old had a son, a uh, son called Seth, and then Seth at a certain age had a son, and so it goes on. Those genealogies are very detailed in the Old Testament, and so you can go through them. And when you then do that, and assuming those days are ordinary days, six literal days, knowing that Adam was made on day six, and then you take all those genealogies, when you add all that up, it comes to about 6,000 years. So not millions of years, so just thousands of years. Now that assumes, of course, that the days are ordinary days. Now there are many people, even in the church, that say, oh, well, those days could be long periods of time. We don't know what the meaning of the word day is. Do you know the Hebrew word for day is used over 2,300 times in the Old Testament? Do you know the interesting thing? We know what it means everywhere it's used except Genesis 1. Why is that? You know the word day can have different meanings, by the way. For instance, even in English, back in my father's day, means time. It took 10 days to drive across the Australian outback. That means 10, 24-hour days. During the day, the daylight portion of a day, you go to school during the day, right? You have a seven-day week. You get the idea? You might say, in my father's day, in my father's time. See, the word day has a number of different meanings, but context determines meaning. The Hebrew word for day, the Hebrew word yom, it also has those same sorts of meanings. Yom can mean time, like in the day of the Lord, in the time of the judges, it means time. The main meaning for the word day, this is going to shock you all, the main meaning for the word day, by the way, is day. That's the main meaning. But it can mean other things. It can mean time, it can mean uh, daylight portion of a day and so on. Here's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is this, 
is that uh, when you um, look at the Hebrew meaning of the word day, when the word day is qualified by a number in the Old Testament, it means an ordinary day. When you have the phrase evening and morning, it means an ordinary day. When the word day is qualified by evening or morning, it means an ordinary day. And the word day is qualified by night, it means an ordinary day. According to the rules of Hebrew, we know when the word day means an ordinary day. When you have evening and morning, or you have the word evening with day, or the word night with day, or the word morning with day, or a number with the word day. So let's see what we read in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, for the first day, we see night, evening, morning, number, day. I've got a slight hint as to what I think it means. Let's look at the next one. Evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. You realize something? If the word day was written like that, anywhere else in the Old Testament, you wouldn't question it was an ordinary day. In fact, you'd, in fact it looks like it's, it, it only needs a number with the word day to mean an ordinary day. Here you've got number, you've got evening, you've got morning, you've got the phrase evening and morning. You've even on the first day you've got the word night. It's almost as if God is saying these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick uh, that, that I'm going to qualify this over and over again to make them realize it's an ordinary day and they still won't believe it. What's wrong with people? The word day in Genesis 1 means an ordinary day. Now, in Genesis 2, when it says, in the, day, in, in, in the day that the Lord created, or in the day that you eat, you will die, the word day there is not qualified by evening, morning, or number. There it means time, in the time that you eat, in the time that God created. It, it, you've got to follow the rules of a language. That's what you have to do. By the way, think about this. Where do we get the idea of our week from? We get the day from the rotation of the earth, the month from the earth and the moon, the year from the earth and the sun. You know where the seven-day week comes from? The Bible. Exodus 20, verse 11. God made everything in six days, rested for one. But then I have these people, oh, these people drive me nuts. These people in the church, they come up to me and say, well, the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. Who's heard that argument before? You heard that? Oh, that's when I want to punch people in the nose. So I have to make sure I don't do that. Do you know the first thing I say to them when they say that? They say, the, the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. Yeah, we'll read the rest of the verse, and a thousand years are like a day. That just cancels that one right out. And think about this. This is a phrase in Second Peter talking about God is not limited by natural processes and time. The context is the second coming, saying, oh, you know why God hasn't come yet? To him a day is like a thousand years, or a thousand years is like a day. This is not defining the word day in Genesis. You can't use a phrase from the New Testament to determine the meaning of a Hebrew word. That's nonsense. You can't do that. The word day in Genesis 1 means an ordinary day. We need to understand that. Now, what about Christians who believe in millions of years? There are Christians who believe in millions of years. Well, can Christians believe in millions of years? I would say this. Just because you believe in millions of years doesn't mean you're not a Christian because a self, you know, your salvation is conditioned by faith in Christ, not by what you believe about the age of the earth. But if you believe in millions of years, you have a problem as a Christian. You have a major problem, many major problems. Let me share one of them with you. When God first made everything in six days, at the end of the sixth day after he made man, he said, everything he made was very good. Everything. Everything up until that time was very good. Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God said, Adam and Eve are eating fruit and the animals were eating plants. We weren't told we could eat meat until Genesis 9, after the flood. It wasn't until after the flood that God said, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you all things to eat. Now I give you everything. And that's the reason you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything. Uh, so, see, even the origin of a hot dog is in Genesis. You can tell people that, okay? Now, God gave Adam a test, a test of obedience. Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely what? Die. Adam sinned. He rebelled against God. Death came into the world. In fact, the first death was when God killed animals and clothed Adam and Eve. The first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When uh, Adam sinned, God started the sacrificial system. The Israelites sacrificed animals over and over again, but an animal can't take away our sin because the Bible says uh, in Hebrews 
For instance, the Bible says it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin because we're not connected to the animals. We didn't evolve from the animals. Hebrews also says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sins. And we're reminded in Leviticus that the life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, because Adam sinned and we forfeit our right to live, our bodies die because we're made in the image of God. We have a soul that would live forever, but separated from God forever. So to pay the penalty for sin, God sent his son to become one of us, the God-man, the babe in a manger, to then die on a cross, be raised from the dead, shed his blood. See, so, so because death was the penalty for sin, then there had to be the payment for sin. A life has to be given to pay the penalty for sin. But it has to be a perfect man. A man brought sin and death. It can't be any one of us. We're sinners, which is why God's son stepped into history to be the perfect man. See how it all fits together? Isn't that incredible? Now, if you believe in millions of years, you've got a problem. Because if you believe in millions of years, and incidentally, do you realize that's the origin of clothing as well? God gave, God gave Adam and Eve coats of skins, coats of skins. And uh, that's where uh, clothes came from. Think about it. Animals don't wear clothes. Humans wear clothes. Why? We have a moral conscience. We know. We're sinners. We, and, and, and we're made in the image of God. Because, how does an evolutionist explain that? I mean, if we're just animals, why should we wear clothes? And I notice you all are, which is very good, by the way. Um, so continue to do that. That's, that's important. Because if you're an evolutionist and you say there's no God, why should you? Oh, by the way, more and more, they are shedding their clothes on television and so on. Because they refuse to acknowledge who they are. That they're, that they're created in the image of God and that they're sinners. Now, if you believe in millions of years, here's the problem. If you believe in millions of years as a Christian, then there was millions of years of death and bloodshed before man. And God would call that very good. Not only that, if you got the shedding of blood millions of years before sin, what has the shedding of blood got to do with the remission of sins? Also, in the fossil record, you've got evidence of animals eating each other and bones in their stomachs. How could that exist before God said they were, they were vegetarian? And not only that, but in the fossil record, you've got lots of examples of diseases. There are examples of cancer, brain tumors, arthritis in the bones in the fossil record. Said to be millions of years before man. But wait a minute, after God made man, he said everything he made was very good. Would God call cancer very good? No, he's not responsible for, for disease and suffering. We are. We sinned against a holy God. There are thorns in the fossil record said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible says thorns came after the curse. You see, these two things can't be true at the same time. You can't have a fossil record of animals eating each other, diseases, bloodshed for millions of years before man, if the Bible's message of salvation and what the Bible records concerning history is true. Which is why that means your fossil record has to come after sin, which makes sense as to, oh, of course, there was a global flood. If there was a global flood, you'd find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth which is what you do find. In fact, the Bible says that death is an enemy. It's an intrusion. Death hasn't always been here. Evolutionists say death, death, in fact, the late Carl Sagan said the secrets of evolution are time and death. Death and time bring life. You know what the Bible puts together? It doesn't put time and death together. The Bible puts sin and death together. In fact, Romans 8 says the whole of creation groans, groans in pain. In other words, it was a perfect creation. Now we live in a fallen creation. One day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. You know, it's, it's important uh, to understand something else here because uh, I uh, know of people, like if you've ever heard of Dr. Hugh Ross, who tells people to believe in millions of years and so on. He says, people in Answers in Genesis are wrong. There was death before sin because plants die, because they were given plants for food. But you see, that's not correct. Here's what's not correct. There's a Hebrew word nephesh, which means life spirit, which man has, animals have, plants do not. Plants are not alive like animals are. They're different. Plants were given for food. They don't have a life spirit. In fact, you can even, you can even see that yourselves. I mean, imagine that, you know, you were taking, uh, uh, a, a guy was taking his girlfriend out in, uh, to the woods to look at the sunset. And you say, look, there's a dead tree Let's sit on the dead tree, gaze into each other's eyes, enjoy the sunset, have a romantic evening. Can you imagine what would happen if you took your girlfriend out there and said, oh, there's a dead rotting animal. Let's sit on that rotting animal. 
let's gaze into each other's eyes and have a beautiful romantic evening. Do you think there's something different about animal death compared to plant death? There is. We decorate the stage often with dead plants, but you wouldn't, you know, shoot a cow, drag it up here, let it rot on the stage or something like that. There's something very different about animal death. The Bible makes it clear man's sin led to death, which is why when you look at all those dead things in the rock layers all over the earth, they have to be explained after sin. The flood makes sense of them. You know what, young people? generations of young people like yourself out there in the world are being told the fossil record is the record of evolution actually the fossil record is the record of the judgment of the flood to warn you that god judges wickedness but god provides an ark of salvation no and his family had to go through an ark door through the door of the ark to be saved jesus christ said i am the door by me if any man enter in he'll be saved i pray every one of you has gone through that ark of salvation now, there's lots of other things we can look at. People say, but isn't there overwhelming evidence that the earth is millions of years old and so on? I mean, secular scientists say the earth is 5 billion years old and the universe is 15 billion years old. Well, I don't have time to go through all of that. I encourage you, if you can get the Check This Out DVD, has a wonderful little animation in there about dating methods, that dating methods all have all sorts of assumptions behind them. You know what most people don't realize? There are hundreds and hundreds of dating methods you can use and the majority of them, over 90% of them, actually confirm that things are young. You don't hear about the 90%. You only hear about uh, some of the supposed dating methods that supposedly show that things are old. Look, just to show you the problems with dating methods, you know, back in the, um, when Mount St. Helens erupted, May 18th, 1980, well, in the 80s, a lava dome started to form. See this lava dome sealing off the volcano? That lava dome, so that's from new rock forming, brand new rock forming. So that's, when that formed, that's zero years old. And uh, so in uh, 1994, uh, there was a scientist who sampled the darbalome, uh, the, 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 the um, lava dome, I should say, sampled uh, the lava dome for dating. And they used potassium argon, one of those radiometric dating methods. And he used three ways of doing it. One was just the whole rock and uh, ground it up. Another one was a mineral amphibole. And another one was this one, uh, th this mineral here. And when he used potassium argon dating, look, uh, when he just ground up the whole rock, it dated to 0.35 million years old. Uh, when he dated using this one, it dated to 0.9 million years old, and this one, 2.8 million years old. You know how, how old that Dharma d uh, lava dome is? It was formed in the 80s. So how could it be millions of years? How could it even be hundreds of thousands of years old? Can't. I, a, another uh, dating method that can show that things can't be millions of years old is carbon dating. Many people don't realize that carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years. The half-life of carbon... 5,730 years is so short, after 100,000 years, carbon-14 would all be gone. So carbon dating can only date things thousands of years. Here's the point. If something's millions of years old, it shouldn't have carbon-14 in it. There's radioactive carbon-14 in dinosaur bones, in coal deposits, in oil. Massive documentation on that. In fact, here's an example where these diamonds are said to be 1 to 2 billion years old, and so some creation scientists sent them to a lab, had them crushed, and dated using carbon dating, and using carbon dating, they dated at 58,000 years old. Wait a minute, if they're one to two billion years old, they can't have any carbon-14 in them. The fact that they have carbon-14 in them, now I don't, we don't agree with the 58,000 because there's lots of assumptions behind dating methods, but the point is that can't be billions of years old or there would be no carbon-14 in it. There's lots of examples like that. When it comes to astronomy, comets, you know, there's short period comets, long period comets. Even if you're looking at the long period comets, they can only orbit for a maximum of 10 million years. How come we still have comets? Short period comets can only orbit for a number of thousands of years, yet we still have comets. How do we have comets? You know what the evolutionists say? Oh, there's a cloud out there called the Oort cloud that gives birth to comets. Anyone seen it? No. How do you know it's there? We've got comets. That's really what they're saying. They're saying the universe is billions of years old. There has to be a way these comets form. How about the universe not be billions of years old? Oh, no. They won't consider that. What about the moon? Tidal force is actually causing the moon to spiral away from the Earth. And so if you take the rate at which it's doing that and you sort of go backwards in time, uh, it was only slightly closer uh, 6,000 years ago 
but it would have been touching the Earth in far less time than the 4.5 billion years that they say uh, is the age of the Earth. <laughs> in other words, that goes against the millions of years. What about spiral galaxies? We have lots of spiral galaxies out there. Spiral galaxies rotate differentially. The inner parts rotate faster than the outer parts. The spiral arms would be twisted beyond recognition in far less than their accepted evolutionary age. In other words, they can't be millions of years old. They would have disappeared. Look, there are so many examples like that uh, that we could give. Uh, and over and over again, we're showing, look, what the Bible says is true. Its history is true. Let me show you just one more. Do we all go back to Adam and Eve? You know, people say, how do you explain all the different skin colors? Actually, everyone has the same skin color. It's not the amount of, it's not the color you have, it's the shade you have. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all one race. When the Human Genome Project mapped the human genome back in the year 2000, they announced to the world there's only one race. See, the Bible is correct. In fact, let me show you one of those short uh, videos from the Check This Out to help us understand that, and then we'll wrap this up. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26, where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children, and those children had children, and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark, and according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. But oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11, and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who were descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together, they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point, though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which, by the way, represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. See, isn't this simple? It really is when you understand this. By the way, think about this, the Australian Aborigines. When they were first discovered, 
And there are books in Australia in museums that have their Dreamtime legends that were recorded from them before they ever met missionaries. And you know what their Dreamtime legends sound like? They have a flood, three sons on a boat, the boat lands in a mountain, woman was made while man was asleep, a uh, woman took uh, some sweet honey from Biami's tree, and that's why death came into the world. Th they have stories that sound like Genesis. How could they be? But it's not just the Australian Aborigines, the American Indians, the Fijians, the Hawaiians, the Eskimos, and so it goes on. Back to the Babylonians. You know why? They handed down the account of creation, the flood, and so on through the Tower of Babel. They've changed it, but the real record's in the Bible, but the elements are still there all across the world because people, the Bible's history is true. And so as we wrap this up, here's what I want us to understand. I want us to understand that there's been a battle going on ever since the beginning in Genesis 3. It's a battle between two worldviews because there's a battle between two religions. In Genesis 3, the devil came to Eve and said, did God really say, and then he went on to say, you can become like God. There's a battle between God's word and man's word. They're the only two religions in the world in an ultimate sense. And that's been going on ever since the beginning. And that battle is really a battle of two world views. For instance, as Christians, what about marriage? Why, what do we believe about marriage? Well, actually, in Matthew 19, when Jesus was asked about marriage, he said, haven't you read, he made the beginning male, the male and female, and said, for this reason shall a man cleave his, unto each, his wife, and, and you become one pl flesh, for the woman was made from the man. In other words, the doctrine of marriage is based upon Genesis, is to be a man and a woman. Jesus reiterated that in Matthew 19. God invented marriage. God made marriage. Marriage comes from the Bible. If you don't believe in God, what's marriage? Whatever you want to make it to be. And you live in a time when we see the whole issue of gay marriage being pushed across this nation. And people, we've got to understand something. That is against God's word. It's very simple. It, all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis, not just marriage, but all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis. And so, as a Christian, we have a Christian worldview. We know what's right and what's wrong because God is the absolute authority. We know marriage is a man and woman. God invented marriage. We know it would be wrong to abort babies because right at the point of conception. Did you know when a sperm fertilizes egg, think about it from an information perspective. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, the fertilized egg then has the unique combination of information for that individual. Different from the mother, different from the father, but it came from the mother and the father. No new information is ever added. In fact, do you know a fertilized egg, the body wants to reject it because it's a foreign body, because it's not the same combination of information as the mother, but, the, but God has an inbuilt mechanism to overcome the rejection process so it will plant in the womb and develop uh, in, into uh, the, the body uh, uh, that God gives us. In other words, do you know what abortion is? Abortion is murdering a human being. That's what it is. You can't get away from it. That's the bottom line. You know, and, and when people say to you, oh, I was just a fetus or whatever, no new information is added. All the information that builds you is all there. It's right there from conception, right there from fertilization. And, but you see, on the basis of man's word, if man determines truth, what's marriage? Whatever you want to make it to be. What's abortion? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? You look at the Israelites and the pagan tribes uh, in those days that were sacrificing children, abortion is no different to that. And what we see happening in America today, we see the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism because increasingly we have generations who reject God's word and generations who say, no, it's man that determines truth. And you're growing up in a culture seeing that battle really fought furiously right before our very eyes. And sadly, it's because generations of kids like you have been told the Bible's not true. That's why it's so important, I believe, for us to do what we do. I encourage you to use our website. Go there, thousands of articles. We make these booklets available out here behind me here is a, a lobby, and we're going to have a table there. And if you want to get any of these materials, I'll have someone there to help you. We don't charge you tax for these ones that's special or anything like that. There'll be a box there. If you want to just throw the money in and grab the materials, you can do it that way. Instead of $6 each, these uh, pocket guides that cover a whole range of topics are $1 each. It's about 17 of them, I think. And then to check this out, you've seen two videos from this. There are six altogether. It's a $20 video, video uh, DVD. You can have that for $2. A talk similar to what I gave you today, it was recorded in another conference called Science Confirms the Bible. 
Um, we let you have that for two dollars, and then where uh, uh, Ray Comfort interviews all these students and professors and so on about evolution to show you, you know what it shows you? If you've got answers, you can run rings around these people because they can't defend their faith. It's a very, very important DVD uh, for uh, that reason. And then uh, I would encourage uh, your uh, teachers and others that are here just real quickly, let me share with you just a couple of things. Uh, the answers books uh, for this age group this is the most comprehensive collection of the most asked questions, 130 of them, with detailed answers. This new book, Confound the Critics, teaches you how to answer skeptics when they challenge you uh, and how to point out logical fallacies. Uh, we have a new book that just came out, all the background information on the Bill Nye debate. Remember when Bill Nye just kept flashing up on, on the screen all sorts of supposed evidences and things, so many of them, you couldn't even begin to try to answer them. It was just one after, just to try to, try to you know, influence people. Actually, we went through every single one of them and answered them in detail uh, in that book. And uh, we also put out, you know, the, the DVD of the Bill Nye debate and the Confound the Critics book and the new uh, book on the debate, and we put them in a special box set uh, there as well. Also, we have lots of other apologetics materials. Um, the, uh, a, a good course for young people uh, like this age group, the foundations curriculum set, uh, 12 30-minute programs of mine with a curriculum that goes with them that's highly discounted. And this one is a Christian worldview curriculum done specially, a creation-based Christian worldview curriculum, especially for teenagers, uh, and we highly discount that as well. So uh, I am uh, going to finish there. I, I want to pray for us, and then uh, you're dismissed. I encourage you to take advantage of those special offers we're making for you. Uh, and as I said, on those special offers, we won't charge you tax, but you can get whatever you want of those and uh, then the other materials that are there. And tonight is the last night of our conference we're having here. starts at 6.30. Let's pray. A gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just praise you that your word is truth. Lord, there are so many forces in this world. Now, your word says men love darkness rather than light because we're sinners. We know that the devil really is out to, to, to get us, to, to take us away from the truth of God's word and the gospel. Help us not to, Lord, give in to those, those doubts and the way that people try to make uh, so many others to, to doubt the word of God. Help us not to fall into that trap. And Lord, I, I pray that you would help each of these young people here and the teachers to be equipped, equipped with answers so they can defend their faith and go out and point others to the true message of what life is all about, the fact that we're created but we're fallen, but that God from eternity had a plan to offer a free gift of salvation and that we all need to go through that door to be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.